Well, hello everybody, this is Tim Green with Randall Magazine. Welcome to your Critique of the Week. It is Friday, December 22nd. Thanks so much for joining me. Sorry for the bit of a slow start, a couple minutes late. I was trying to find... Um, let's see. I don't know, I don't understand. So X, the X platform, has um, uh, a chat option now. You know, we used to say, um, you know, find if you'd like to participate and you're on the X platform, uh, go to YouTube or Facebook. But now there's a chat option, so I'm not sure. But I can't find how to see the chat, so... <laughs> so, um, uh, whatever. Let me see this. No, that doesn't work. Anyway, uh, welcome to the Critique of the Week. Thanks, to everybody, for, uh, for being here. Let's see what we've got on... Um, Let's see, we've got uh, Monica Dobos is here, and Dick Westheimer, Nate Jacob, Deb T, Elizabeth Wolf, hello, Katie Dozier, hey Katie, uh, Eva Christine is here, uh, Nancy Sabin Sobinick, uh, Steve Horrell, uh, Maney, yeah, got a good crowd over on YouTube, Cindy Gun Guntherman, uh, D. Coleman is here as well, Facebook, uh, Facebook doesn't show the videos as much as they used to, so... Fewer people there, but Tara Meslick McMahon and Jenny Middleton, two excellent critiquers. Thanks for joining me. And I cannot figure out how to broadcast. I mean, if there's a chat, <laughs> wouldn't you want to be able to see the chat on X? Anyway, well, that's something to figure out for next time. Now, for this critique of the week, we're going to be taking a look at the oldest submissions in the submission queue, and because uh, I'd like to, I'd like to get caught up and, and share as many as we could. Um, you know, so there's not as much of a weight. I think it'd be great to have less of a weight. Uh, but as always, the point of the critique is to give that workshop experience and let people know what strangers think about their poems and what works, what doesn't. Leave as many comments as you can. Um, anything you can say uh, could be helpful. So please do share as much as you would. We have a request to start out with a poem that we published. Um, I think it was James Langford who asked if we could look at this poem, Four Guys in a Truck which uh, we reposted. I pulled it up from the archives as the daily poem on December 12th. Let's take a look at this poem here. Four guys in a truck. It was from the uh, red number 36, the winter 20, 2011 um, tribute to Buddhist poets. So Tony Tregilio is a Buddhist poet. And um, he shared this poem, Four Guys in a Truck. So let's take a look at it and um, we'll see what you think. Four guys in a truck. And I think the implication um, that James was sort of getting at is James here? It'd be nice if he was here. <laughs> but, um, um, yeah, well, Elizabeth Wolf asks, how long is the queue for the critique submissions? What I've been doing is sort of alternating now between pulling out some stuff that looks especially interesting, that so there might not be a very long wait at all, like a week or two um, since you submit, and then, um, and then going through every other episode and just looking at the oldest ones and getting through as many as we can in a little more quicker run. And I think, um, so the oldest ones there are about 11 months old and the newest ones are, um, you know, yesterday. So, uh, that's, that's the way it rolls. Let's see. Um, anyway, this is four guys in a truck and, and James Langford was asking, I think, I think the, um, what he said about it was, um, sort of implying like like how is this a poem what what it makes it a poem that works for you because it's a pretty simple poem so let's take a look at four guys in a truck by troni tregilio the rooms were stolen by four guys who joked about everything i owned talked and shrink wrapped my bookshelf at the same time i bought them pizza for lunch they hulked at the table without uh, their knees touching one pepperoni one plain argued about the bears packers game tomorrow the mood was muscular I watched the whole time, my excuse, lower lumbar vertebrae. The rooms crowded with crutches, mirrors, sconces, and droopy desert painting, the droopy desert painting I bought the last year of my marriage. What looks lashed in bubble wrap, like a very large waffle. Could be just another boring Saturday. How they got the desk through the kitchen. How they wrapped a mattress, a ladder in the living room, where my television used to be. So that's, um... Yeah, that's um, that's four guys in a truck, and Cindy Cindy says I love this poem. We have two men in a truck here for movers. I think the two men in a truck is a national chain. I've seen that a bunch. Um, four guys in a truck. Um, and maybe that was what inspired the poem a little bit, calling it that. Yeah, Cindy says too. I love the um, the mood was muscular. That's a great way to put it. 
Um, so I, I love that line too. But the thing I wanted to highlight, you know, since uh, James asked, is is the the clarity of this poem. You know, you'd know exactly where you are. Um, and I was reading through um, the um, the prisoners. Um, you know, we had that prisoner express issue that we did um, a year and a half ago. And we have a whole bunch of um, submissions that I'm trying to get through because people just send mail and I have to put them in a box and then I go through the box every once in a while. And I was thinking about how um, the letters are so much more interesting often than the poems because especially there, but really everywhere. Um, because if you just tell your story um, in a way that we can understand in a casual way, it's really interesting. Stories are interesting. We love stories. We love knowing what's going on. And there's a sort of poetry filter that we add to poems, trying to make it seem special and seem important um, and seem poetic. And that really detracts so often more than it, um, than it adds. And so, so you can see how this poem came to be. Uh, you know, the Tony, I imagine, you know, this really happened, I'm assuming. Um, he mentions it in the note, too, um, that uh, it was a two-year period. I got divorced, moved twice, and lost two close family members. And so he's talking about that experience. And so this happened to him. You know, he watches two four guys in a truck move all of his stuff out of a house. And th there's a feeling when certain things happen in your life that there's more to it than that. There's a deeper story behind the story. And you get a kind of itch to sort of make it more understood um, and, um, and, and, and try to make sense of it. Like, what is that thing? There's like an emotional resonance you kind of feel. And so if you go through and just tell that story very accurately and very clearly, then you can follow that thread and see, you know, what the what the sort of emotional or psychological significance of that is. And I think that's what Tony was doing here. So we start out four guys in a truck, you know, where um, the rooms were stolen by four guys who joked about everything I owned. And so that first line, you know, the stolen is kind of funny because you're not quite sure what the four guys in a truck mean. And so you think uh, at first maybe it's a theft that's going on. So you get that slight, you know, twist on it. Talked and tricked to wrap my bookshelf at the same time. And then I bought them pizza for lunch. So by then, by the sixth line in, you know exactly what's going on. You know, it's a moving company. They're moving all of his stuff. And then it's just described very clearly the scene like you would just look like going through sort of the scroll of your memory of what you remember. Uh, I bought them pizza for lunch. Uh, they hulk at the table without their knees touching one pepperoni, one plane, and argued or argued about the Bears Packers game tomorrow. The mood was muscular, that great line. I watched the whole time, my excuse, lumbar vertebrae. And so this whole poem still, I mean, is just the sort of thinking back on this this experience, describing it in a way that we can very clearly and easily understand, and letting it go where your mind wanders you know i watched the whole time and then you think in yourself well this is why i was watching this is my excuse um the room's crowded with crutches or, or couches i should say sorry i said crutches twice the room's crowded with couches mirrors sconces the droopy desert painting i bought the last year of my marriage and then you get this the last year of my marriage so then we drop this detail in that it has to do with divorce and that's why the move is going on um what looks like or what looks lashed in bubble wrap, like a very large waffle. So we have another little humor. So we, we have these little dashes of humor, this clear storytelling, we, and where we know what's going on. Um, yeah, and as Dick Westheimer says, the marriage sneaks in. And, and two, the, as Rosenard says, the two pizzas between four masculine guys, like imagining them eating you know, a whole half of a pizza is kind of amusing too. And so there's a lot of those sort of light, amusing stuff. But then we have this marriage sneaking in. Um, the last year of my marriage, which sort of fills out the story and sort of and then the whole of like what is going on kind of blossoms out of that, that you can know the kind of the background of the whole situation. So this is just really good storytelling in a really clear, simple, direct way. Um, um, could be just another boring Sunday. This is another key line, too. Could be another, just another boring Sunday. Um, how they got the desk through the kitchen, how they wrapped the, a mattress a ladder in the living room where my television used to be. And so so for them, so the thing that sort of, the, the conclusion I think that Tony comes to in, in sort of exploring his own emotions about this experience is the way that to the movers, um, you know, it's just another day, another Saturday of work where they're doing their job, you know, moving someone else out. To him, it's this massively 
significant life experience. This um, you know shift in your status, the going from married to divorce, is a big deal. Um, and you know it's one of those like key moments in his life. But to the movers, it's just another day. And so there's a sense of the way that um, you know the way that you don't know what everybody else is going through. Don't even think about it often. We kind of ignore that. And, and we're sort of locked in our own little worlds. Um, and so, yeah. And then um, we end, as Nate Jacobs says, it builds beautifully into that last, that simple sense of loss at the end, understated but perfect. Yeah, how they wrapped a mattress. And so like like that idea of wrapping a mattress where they'd slept, you know, and then a ladder in the living room where a television used to be. So there's this sort of sense of emptiness, the missingness of that experience of having moved out. Um and the, yeah, and they used to be exactly as Elizabeth Wolf says. So, I mean, what you have here is just this really clear, simple storytelling toward understanding what it is psychologically and emotionally that was significant about this moment. Why did it have resonance? Um, and, and you know, this is the kind of, I think of this as a, um, a simple sort of classic rattle poem. I always say that, you know, I'm looking for more of these types of poems um, because, you know, this is the kind of, um, you know, real life storytelling of what we actually experience um, that, that makes our lives richer, that makes us all connect more and that anybody can appreciate. You know, this is not the kind of poem that we're, we're hiding behind some kind of deep metaphors, even though the metaphors are here. There's very subtle music in this. There's a lot of symbolism with the mattress and the television, that hole that's that used to be there that's gone, um, you know, and so... Um, yeah. And so, so this is the kind of thing, and, and this is sort of um, how easy it is to write a poem when you're not trying too hard. I always mention this, but um, on Bukowski's tombstone, it says, don't try. And, um, you know, there's a lot of ways you can interpret it that, but, but one of the things that you can, can think about is, you know, get out, like, don't get in the way of your own poem. Uh, and, and I think that happens so much. If you look through, the submissions. It's so common that the contributor note that people write spontaneously just in the little box on submittable is more interesting than the poem they're submitting because the poem has all this heightened, elevated attempts at sounding poetic. But we want to hear stories. I mean, and not just rattle, but human beings. Like we're trained, we're tuned to hearing other people's stories so we can see what other lives are like. I mean, it's part of what we do. That's part of what makes us human. And so telling your story um, clearly is something to, to really search for when you have a story. And then the key is to know, notice those emotionally salient moments. And when you have those, you can just tell it sort of straightforward, see, kind of dig into the emotion a little bit, let the symbolic part of your mind do its job coming up with things like that missing TV and that mattress. And, and that's the kind of thing that, that resonates with a reader and is memorable. And, you know, and so, um, um, you know, I guess that's the point with this, though, is it this, you know, don't try to do too much with a poem and you can come up with a really good poem. Um, and uh, yeah, so Guy Chambers says, like this poem, simple and true to life experience. Yeah. Um, Eva Christine says, I've been missing solid storytelling. It's rare to find. And, and it is. I think I think that's one of the things that um, the MFA world kind of, you know, there's so much sort of posturing. And, and, you know, forgetting that another thing that, that I find, too, is like if you're if you're at a playground, which I you know used to be at a lot when the kids were younger and you start talking to somebody at first, it's like the weather and stuff. But as soon as you dive into somebody's like the deeper things about their life, it's really interesting. Like there's nobody that's boring in the entire world. Everybody has these really rich, complicated inner lives, these these complicated stories. And, and they're always interesting. And it's only when we try to sort of dance around and pretend you know, hide and, and be, you know, clued things and um, cover it up with, um, you know, too much sort of forcing poetry out that the poetry disappears. And that's another reason why the young poets do such a great job is because they're not trying. And so, um, so anyway, that is the little lesson I wanted to share with us four guys in the truck. And thanks to James Langford for, um, for picking it up. You know, I do, there is some nice music to it too. Um, you know, um, you can hear a lot. There's a there's a natural rhythm. There's a na music to natural speech that we just do, and that's here in this poem. There's a lot of little alliterations, a lot of little slant rhymes and stuff that just come out naturally. Um, you know, it's one of those things where the 
the, you know, the by not trying, you let the natural music come out. Like you just sort of automatically tap your feet too. Um, yeah. Okay, so let's move on to see, um, and, and maybe keep that in mind too as we look at other poems, because this is very much like uh, reading through submissions. And you just see so many poets, you know, trying too hard to be profound when really all of our lives are automatically profound. All our stories are automatically interesting if we share them. So um, here we go. Let's take a look at um, some newer poems. And this is just a little bit. Um, this first one up is sorry. I got to change the size of the window a little bit. Um, this is Jerry Stephenson, our very own. So that's interesting. So this is a submission from um, January 25th of last year. So we're, like I said, in about 11 months old. And uh, here's Jerry. He has um, uh, some questions. He says, uh, hi, Tim, light on duty today. Hence, this is one of two poems. Trust that works. So here we go. It's pasted into the body of the uh, submission. And no special questions, so let's take a look at Jerry's poem. <laughs> Here he goes, too. This is um, from Jerry. Let me kind of get this a little bigger, like maybe there. Let's kind of do that, too, to get to focus on this. Um, let me get that over. Yeah, sorry for the... Okay. Yeah, let's look at this. We can really focus. Okay, so he says this is funny. He says, please pick one of three snappy titles. A, martyr. B, moderately bearing my soul. Or C, attempt to shortcut a fee for editing service. <laughs> so that's interesting. And here he goes. Writing for critique of the week, my hat aimed at the ring. Now the moment to fling, not a neat, not a feat for the meek. Should I be clever, quick, stylus in hand, ink at the ready, cliche in my brain, hold them steady, the poetic bomb, tempting, starting to tick. Punctuate or not, slashes or dots, form fed lead, or what pops into head, flip a coin, damn cliche, or spin a rhyme, thread, adult or target children, tots. Mystifying to me, must dot my T's, not cross my eyes, like alternating up my soul for flaying. Will my thought prevailing? Will my will hold dermis armor be stout be sturdy but a competition this is not why get it a knot leave my fate or be not upon the crashing literature buzzing shore or being swept up from the hive of editing room floor i'll let it be apology to paul mccartney Incolat <laughs> incolated by jerry oh yeah i think this is another uh interesting i think he pasted it twice anyway so that's the poem and uh, we're calling it Martyr, Moderately Bearing My Soul, Attempt to Shortcut a Fee for Editing Service. And yeah, and definitely. Monica Dobo says C. Um, and definitely, I think that's the best the title too, Attempt to Shortcut a Fee for Editing Service. Um, and this is one of those, actually, I would call a private poem, even though it's private to this community. You know, it's, it's um, you know, self-referential in a way that if it was published somewhere, um, obviously nobody would realize it. But because it's it's a uh, private to us, like we get to know, it's the same thing as writing a poem to a friend or family or for an occasion, um, for a wedding or something like that, you know. And so there's a different um, sort of goal with this kind of poem. Um, you know, he's clearly trying to amuse us and clearly is. So thanks for sharing this, Jerry. Um, but it's a different, it, it's important to point out, it's a different thing you're trying to do um, than, uh, than if you were, um, you know, publishing, you know, writing something for publication where you're a stranger. Um, <laughs> Elizabeth Wolf has a great idea. She says, I'd stick with, please pick one of three snappy titles. Um, I think that's a great suggestion too without listing them. Yeah. If you were going to go with one of these three, um, I think, um, you know, that's the best one attempt to shortcut a fee for editing service. But, uh, but I do like the idea of just doing this and then not listing them. Um, so, so what else can we say about this poem? I mean, it entertained us and that was kind of the goal. Clearly writing for critique of the week, my hat aimed at the ring. Now the moment to fling not a feat for the meek. And so um, I, don't, I think it's a nice start out. Um, and we have the, uh, the rhyme scheme set up with the ring and fling, the weak and the meek. So we know what, how that's going to go. I think it carries on. 
does it carry on to the whole poem? It kind of drops out here, which is interesting, and turns into more free verse poem. Um, what else could we say? There's a, I, I think to, to take it back to, um, if you were sort of making it a more public poem, um, you know, for a magazine and not just for fun here, I think um, that, that that story about the four guys in a truck applies here too. Um, the most interesting thing, if this were really about, you know, what it was and not a sort of meta poem that's just amusing us, um, the most interesting thing would be the actual relationship and the personal experience of doing this and, and having more of that, just directly telling what it feels like, um, I think is where it connects the most. Um, but anyway, thanks for sharing that, Jerry. Uh, that was a fun, a fun poem to see. Let's, uh, let's see what's next. Um, next up, is it going to be another one by Jerry or not? He said, he mentioned something too. Anyway, okay, this is someone different. This is Alia Barrett, Barrett's, Barrett's, um, and the poem is Drowning. The question, I keep finding my poetry going off in two different directions, so I write them both. How do I manage to combine them? Every time I try to edit, I feel like I change the entire message. Well, that's a very interesting question. Thanks for sharing that in this poem, uh, Alia. Let's take a look. And the poem is called Drowning, and uh, here we go. Drowning. Let me make it a little bigger, too. Okay. Drowning. I am underwater. Many have tried and failed for nearly a decade to help me out of the hole that I have dug myself in. They don't understand how deep the hole has gotten. It's filled with quicksand, and so trying to pull me out has only dug me deeper. Maybe once they realize how deep I am, they'll help me. The only way I felt that I could find help was to dig myself deeper. I chose to drown because if I didn't, I would spend the rest of my life struggling to stay afloat. Sometimes the only way to get them to notice is to go as deep as you can and hope they realize their mistakes and get you out. They only care once you go deep enough for them to send out the special teams to get you out. So that's really interesting. So this is a kind of... Um, a poem um, just on topic that, um, is this a separate poem? Let's see. Oh, I guess it keeps going. I'm sorry. I thought this was a new, this is just a break. Um, this is the thing too with reading submissions. It's sometimes hard to tell, you know, where one poem ends and the other begins unless you have it really clearly sh shown, you know, so keep that in mind. But let's keep going. To get you out, to describe the concepts, the uh, of daily actions so simple you forget they even exist yet i drown because nobody knows how to teach my lungs how to move for the longest time i faked the feeling of breathing i thought that moving my mouth stretched my stomach or stretching my stomach and wriggling my nose the same way everyone else did would mean that someday somehow i could learn to breathe um, I thought that drowning was part of learning, and so I pushed myself further. When my body was crying out for help, I ignored it. Pain was part of the process, and I saw it as a sign to keep going. So, And so my lungs have never truly breathed. It must keep pretending, and I must keep feeling this pain, because stopping means admitting that I have wasted my time and energy into something that has only brought pain and suffering. Stopping means admitting that I have failed, that I could have been better by now. If only I had done things better. Stopping means that I am a failure, so I didn't stop. I chose to drown. Hmm. Well, it's an interesting poem. Um, the first thing uh, that jumps out, and of course, the um, you know, stopping every line with a comma almost like, till the very end, um, that's, uh, it, it makes for these unnatural pauses. Uh, that don't really fit with with what the poem is trying to do, and and it don't don't fit with syntax, and make it a little more difficult to read. It feels kind of stilty and and, and tripping. Um, and then we go back though to, um, yeah. So Clinton Clark says another private like poem, a bit vague, and that's true. Going back to that four guys in a truck, um, you know that story is so interesting. Like I said, because it's told so clearly with sort of vivid details so we can paint a scene. We know what's going on. We see the picture of it all. Um, and um, 
And, and, and that's the thing that makes it compelling. And, and here we have an abstraction. I'm underwater, which is a metaphor for something, but we don't know what. Um, and, and I think it would be just way better if we got the story. Um, you know, got the story in those clear, simple details where we can see it playing out. Uh, we can know what's going on. Then we can feel like we're going along with it. So the key um, is to tell the story. I think we go back to that, Four Guys in a Truck. I think that's why it was great that James Langford pointed it out. Um, because it is, it's like the, the primary, like really one of the fundamental things when you read submissions, um, the thing that poems don't do is just tell you the story. Um, so there's that too. There's another thing, um, you know, poems, you know, so often go on for too long. Um, they sort of like meander and don't know where they're going. If we wanted to keep this an abstract kind of symbolic thing where you don't exactly know what it's talking about, that can hold up for a little while. Um, you know, and, and so as a metaphor, you know, if we sort of cleaned this up and sort of shrunk it down and, and kept it, you know, ended sort of here instead of keeping going where it didn't really say anything new. If we kept it with the drowning part, you know, I am underwater. Uh, many have tried and failed for nearly a decade to help me out of the hole that I have dug myself in. Let me, um, gosh, there's a poem I'm trying to think of that does something like this this what was it hmm uh, I, I'm, I'm drawing a blank i can't remember something to look it up there's a poem that does this and it's sort of um the whole poem is a really short extended metaphor very tight never mentions what it's really about um i mean um hmm yeah anyway I, I'm not thinking about it. Wait, I can't pull it up in my head. But there's a poem like that. <laughs> and, and you could do something like that where you just focus on the drowning. Let it be an extended metaphor. Show it in, in sort of still detail um, in the same way that the four guys in a truck does. It's a very much heavier subject. But but show some of that drowning. Keep it really tight. And maybe um, and, and that could be a poem, too, it, without going into, you know, what this thing is symbolic for or a symbol of um yeah so uh rose leonard says going back to something tim said along the lines of every line has to add to the story so i wouldn't have and so or maybe on lines by themselves feels like trying too hard to make it poetic um and yeah so so we just want the story um and, and every every line should be adding something to the story that we're being presented um, Nate Jacobs says a better title will go a long way toward establishing what the it is we are exploring here than building a tighter metaphor. I need some surprise here, a turn perhaps toward discovery. Yeah. So, um, you know, I mean, just, just go back to four guys in a truck. You know, the rooms were stolen by four guys who joked about everything I owned, talked and shrink wrapped my bookshelf at the same time. Like we can, you know, I bought them pizza for lunch. That's so clearly put, um, and, and think about how you could tell the story you're trying to tell like that, because we actually want to know. You don't have to hide it. Um, Nate Jacobs' best um, drowning poem is Not Waving But Drowning by Stevie Smith, I believe, he says, or he believes. Yeah. So um, I wish I could remember the poem, because there's a perfect poem to illustrate the way that it could be an extended metaphor. But I, the problem is I can't remember what was the metaphor was or what it was for. Uh, it's just a vague recollection. What what poem was it? It's something from Rattle, of course. Um, oh, well, I'm going to have to give up. But anyway, I mean, the, the thing is, um, you know, we want to we wanna be presented with some kind of, of journey, some kind of story, some kind of arc. And, um, you know, just uh, sort of staying in this abstract, symbolic place doesn't actually convey the story, so we don't get to feel anything from it. Um, Let's see. The, the, the line that I think I like, I think the most is, is pretty early on. To help me out of the whole, let's see, for nearly a decade. Oh, wait. The, the, whole, the whole idea of many have tried and failed for nearly a decade to help me out of the hole that I have dug myself in. There is something about that, about the people who have tried um, to help. And what does help look like? And that's something that can really turn the poem into a story, too, that we can connect with. And what if instead of that... Um, you know, instead of staying with the whole, 
Now we could go there to actual people specifically doing something to help. You know, this person tried this, this person tried this. You know, this person was always there doing this, you know, like that kind of thing where we get start to get to see a sense of the story in, in that. So there are a lot of ways. There's sort of, if you go down sort of the hallway of a poem, there's all these little doors you can open and sort of see what's on the other side. And um, and this kind of, a poem like this kind of goes all the way down the hall without opening any of them. And we sort of stay in the one place. Um, there's just this sort of hallway. Um, and, you know, and there's no sense of like changing directions or surprise, which is what Nate Jacobs is talking about here. Um, yeah, let's share this, uh, oh, let me see, let's do, take a look at this poem by Stevie Smith. I'm just kind of curious because it's a poem I'm not familiar with. Um, it's called Not Waving But Drowning. If it's short, we'll, if short-ish, we'll read it. Uh, Yeah. Not read, not wait. Yeah, it is short. Okay, here's this uh, poem that that uh, Nate Jacob mentioned. Uh, not waving, but drowning. Nobody heard him, the dead man, but still he lay moaning. I was much farther out than you thought, and not waving, but drowning. Poor chap, he always loved, larking, and now he's dead. It must have been too cold for him. His heart gave way. They said, "Oh no, no, no." It was too cold always. Still, the dead one lay moaning. I was much too far out all my life, and not waving, but drowning. So yeah, really powerful poem there. And compare, you know, I, this is the kind of, if we went stuck with a drowning metaphor, um, you know, you could have a tight poem that doesn't mention the problem, but still mentions sort of the feeling of, of, of drowning going along with whatever the actual problem and life story is. I mean, it's not told here what, um, you know, what I was doing, why I was drowning, um, being what, you know, much too far out on my life, what that really means. We don't get the story at all. We get the metaphor symbolically for it. As Nate Jacobs says, it's perfectly short. And really, so many poems are too long. Like, it's really hard to hold people's interest with just words on a page. Um, you know, and if if you're... I think so many poems too, um, you know, the poems tend to not, you know, not tell the story simply and directly. They try to avoid the story so often and they try to, if they find something that kind of works, lingering on that too far. Like once you have an image out there um, and it's connected, like that's enough, like move on or finish the poem. Like it's okay if a poem's short. This poem is really powerful. I'll read it one more time. Not waving, but drowning. Nobody heard him, the dead man, but still he lay moaning. I was much farther out than you thought, and not waving but drowning. Poor chap, he always loved larking, and now he's dead. It must have been too cold for him. His heart gave way, they said. Oh, no, 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 it was too cold always. Still the dead lay moaning. I was much too far out all my life, and not waving but drowning. Now imagine if that poem was like twice as long. You know, it doesn't work at that length. It's beautiful and poignant at this length right here. It hits, it gets its point, hits it in a way um, that feels strong. And, um, and, um, and then, and then leaves, you know, and that's enough. That's good. That's strong. That, that makes us remember. I mean, Nate Jacob pulled this up out of his memory because he had, had such a profound impact on him. And it's here. It's only 12 lines. It's fine to make a poem that short. You know, if he kept on talking about the not waving but drowning, every time you do that over again and every time you extend, you know, once the sort of symbolic image has been implanted in someone else's brain, every time you repeat it, you weaken the emotional impact of it. But letting it be um, here in this tight, concise package lets it be really resonant and, and keeps it strong in your mind. And so that people can, and it was um, with Nate Jacob and then someone else confirmed uh, who it was. It was Steve Horrell. Yeah. And so Steve remembers this poem too. And it's because it's so concise and that image is so powerful. And the poem knew, or the poet, Stevie Smith, knew that and left it there. Um, and so didn't go on. If you look back at this poem, um, you know, I thought that the ending might, you know, I thought it ended here. I thought that it made sense for an ending. And then it just kept going on and not really adding anything to it. So, um, you know, so once you, you find your story that you've told, stick with it. You know, the four guys in a truck poem. We'll go back to that. It ends again 
um, how they wrapped a mattress, a ladder in the living room where my television used to be. And it just ends with that used to be. Unless that image, the absence of that, the, the big life change and the loss, um, it lets that linger and lets us sort of make the connections. Imagine if this poem went on further, a ladder in the living room where my television used to be, a hole where the end table was, the carpet not as stained in that square, <laughs> you know, or whatever. Um, if we kept going, it would weaken that. It's the fact that we let that image sit by itself so we can ponder and, and connect with it and, and let it sort of hang in an afterimage in our minds. That's what makes the poem really powerful. Um, so, so really, I mean, so much is like getting in and getting out. Um, and I think those, those are two pieces of advice we could talk about with this poem. I do. I mean, we want another story, too. So those are the two things to say about that. Let's move on to another poem. And next up, let's see what we have. Um, next poet has two poems. It's um, Nupur Mascara. And here we go. Youth Remembered is one. I guess one's really short. Um, see, this is what you get with submissions. You don't, sometimes you don't, it's hard to tell exactly what you're looking at. So this is another thing. Uh, um, you know, I think the only reason the title is called Two Poems. So otherwise, if this was submitted, because there's no, you know, add extra breaks, you know, make the title look a little different somehow by bolding it or making it a larger font, something to let you know as an editor what you're looking at. I mean, that's something that we... Um, um, you know, you might overlook, but it's important to know if you're sharing poems, um, especially for publication, what um, what actually the poems are, where they start and end. So, so keep that in mind. Two is a tiny note. Youth remembered. A goldfish's tail is a diaphanous sliver, skimming the edge of existence. A ghost fish. And I think that's the whole poem. Youth remembered. So this is nice. There's a um. Uh, I think I'm not, I wonder if anybody said yet, make it a haiku. Yeah. Um, yeah no one said it yet, but, but really there's a haiku here. Um, yeah. We'll, we'll move it up. I think, uh, Brian Sullivan said the poem's a little blurry. I'll make it bigger. Maybe that's better. Um, youth remembered. So, so, so there's, there's, you could really easily imagine making this a haiku. Um, I like the idea youth remembered. There's a cut between youth remembered and, um, in the, in the image of the fish. And, and so there's a sort of symbolic jump. Um, yeah, there's some, is there something, uh, hmm. Elizabeth Wolf says it's blurry too. Yeah. So um, Elizabeth Brown says, uh, Youth Remembered is a cool title for this poem. Um, then with the image of the shining fish. Yeah, it's true. So um, so, so it's a poem that has that, that contrast, that cut between the title and the subject. And there's a nice quality of that, that leap, Youth Remembered. And then this whole thing can become um, an extended metaphor, a very short extended metaphor for youth you know, remembering use, a goldfish's tail is a diaphanous sliver skimming the edge of existence, a ghost fish. Um, Mark Greenish says it's not a haiku, it's a quatrain, and the structure is intrinsic to the poem. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, obviously it's a quatrain, but... Um, Yeah, it's not Yeah, there's uh, there's two poems here, um, there, and then we'll we'll look at the second one. This is a, the uh, on teaching is a different poem, I think. Um, so, a goldfish's tail is a diaphanous sliver. I really like that a lot. Skimming the edge of existence, the abstraction there. Um, hmm. The the abstraction there. Or, or, or of existence. Um, sort of ends the poem for me and then a ghost fish is another another sort of jump um hmm 
Yeah, it feels like there are too many. Yeah, Mercury says like the sonic echo of goldfish ghost fish. And I like that aspect too. I like, I, there's two things. I, there, I guess there's three things I really like. I like the title and, and the way it contrasts with uh, the subject. Then I like um, the, the idea of it, of this, um, the tail, you know, the, the tail of the goldfish um, um, sort of being something that you sort of see and, and, and don't. Like imagine the fish actually seeing its own tail and how fleeting and sort of confusing that would be. There's something really interesting about that concept and about that being a metaphor for youth. I think that's great. Um, and then, um, and then that, that echo of the goldfish becoming the ghost fish. Um, hmm. It, it feels a little um, like it could be tighter, though. You know? Um, yeah, I like Janthi Rangan's make the second line into the, or make the fourth line into the second. Um Yeah, so so what if it was um, a goldfish's tail as a ghost fish skimming the edge of existence? Um, yeah, I, I think that the diaphanous sliver is interesting too, but a little, yeah, hmm. What if it was a gold a goldfish's tail as a diaphanous ghost fish skimming the edge of existence? Hmm. I don't know. There's something that's just a little too much. You know, it would be it feels like it could be tightened up a little bit. I'm not sure exactly. Rose Nurse says I'm on team diaphanous sliver. Um Mark Inner says maybe the abstraction existence could be something more imagistic. Yeah. I don't know. It's an interesting little poem. It um it, it's doing a lot in that, but it doesn't have the as much impact as it could because I think it's a little uh just not as tight as it could be. Um you know, the reason why you know, we talk about haiku, but haiku um it's because of that instantaneous nature that forces you to compare things sort of smush together and you see things both things at the same time that make it really work. Um, and I think, um, and it's a little too long for that effect. And I think if we shorten it, it would have more of that effect, even though it's not a haiku, I think it would still, um, shortening it would make it stronger. Um, let's see. Nate Jacobs says, let goldfish not be possessive. The S is hard to say and unneeded. That's a great point. Yeah. And Clayton Clark agrees. Yeah. A goldfish tail is a diaphanous sliver skimming the edge of existence. A ghost fish. What if it what if it was skimming? Um what if it was a goldfish is a goldfish tail is a diaphanous sliver, a ghost fish at the edge of existence. Um hmm. Janthi could says uh, could existence be changed to life? Yeah, I don't know. I, I find a way to say it. It'd be more powerful if it was sort of one breath and, and those could sort of merge. Um, hmm. Nancy Sobanek says, um, the tightening is needed in the third line. The abstraction throws one out. Just edge is good. Skimming the edge. So a, a, goldfish, a goldfish tail is a diaphanous sliver skimming the edge. A ghost fish. It's just, I think... a. Uh, I think a ghost fish skimming the edge is better. Like combine that. And so it's, there's not a break there. So you can sort of flow through the whole thing. I think that works hmm. a little better. Anyway, there's, I think it's an interesting poem, a little, some kind of little tweak to condense it is all we really need. Let's look at the other one. I'm teaching my four year old daughter writing. Her chalk takes off an airplane up slanting line, down slanting line crashes with equal speed. A sleeping line joins them. An oblivious passenger. Make small as, I say. Her as, or makes, is it A's? Yeah. I think, um, I think it's A's. Make small A's, I say. Her A's loom over mine as she creates mountains as the tectonic 
plate of her chalk hand collides with a board. I pray she will soar over these heights one day. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so this one, I think, what does the um, Chicago say about A's? I think... Um, I think Chicago Manual is the best one to use just in general for, for writing, for creative writing, um, because they focus on sort of elegance and readability or something. Um, um, let me see what they say. I think they say, let's see. Hmm. So they're saying, so they they say you could go either way, is what they say. And, and here it makes it seem like the word as, and so I think for here I would go a apostrophe s, even though it's not possessive. Um, I believe it looks like they're saying I'm not seeing the actual page, but the notes section is saying um, that that's one exception, and it is because you can see. Um, that makes it hard to read. And so make that an apostrophe S just so you don't, so people don't trip over it and get confused. Um, really the whole, the whole thing about like rules for, for writing is just so readers can read. I mean, so it's easy to understand and you don't get confused. That's really what the source of most of those sort of, um, style book conventions actually are, uh, is so that we can, we don't get confused and trip up because I tripped up over that. So make small A's with an apostrophe. Um, Anyway, that's kind of an aside. Yeah. Um, and so I think this poem, too. See, Nancy Sobanek says, a fourth line from the end um, should end with chalk hand collides. Um, to end on a strong verb. And a jam, chalk hand collides can be confusing. Yeah, Nate Jacob says, I like the sentiment of the, the lines, but not the actual last two lines. Yeah. Monica Doba says, I like the conciseness too, but I'm missing the surprise element. Rose Leonard loved the images of flight and landscape. Uh, Mark Grenier, the last two lines could break its soar instead of these. Um, yeah, I pray she will soar, line break, over these heights one day. Um, let's see. Yeah, Clayton Clark says, I love it, but the ending feels a little flat. That's what I'm thinking, too. Um, and, and so, so I think going back, again, we're just going to keep going back to this lesson of the four guys in a truck. Um, I think that's the lesson of the day, and you can see how it applies just all the time. Um, you can see, as nice as this is done, um, you see sort of the overwriting in places where it's just better off to let the images stand and, and let it not be. Because when you, when you, you know, do certain things um, that sort of make little poetic flourishes, you're reminding us that it's a, it's a poet writing a poem and we lose the sort of sense of being lost in the poem. Um, so I'm teaching my four-year-old daughter writing. Um, I think it's a great title. And we get to know exactly where we are. Her chalk takes off an airplane, up slanting line, down slanting line, crashes with equal speed. I think that's perfect. I think it's really wonderfully described. Um, a sleeping line joins them. An oblivious passenger. The, the oblivious passenger um, is sort of hard for me to, to see in the same way that the up slanting line. And I'm not sure what it adds. Um, Make small A's, I say. Her A's loom over her mind and she creates mountains. And then there's the this so I think the creating mountains is a great example of um you can you can suddenly see the A's as mountains. I think that's very vivid and well put. It doesn't need more. As the tectonic plate of her chalk hand collides with a board. I mean that is like like seeing this image and not letting it sit sort of symbolically and have its own power. We're, we're trying to extend it where it doesn't need to be extended. Like I was talking about with um, the last poem. I think it's a great example of that. If you just cut the, um, if you just let it be, um, 
um, you know, let it end in the mountains, then, I mean, what does that add? It's just sort of this poetic flourish that doesn't really add our understanding of anything. Um, and, and, and so it doesn't have anything to do with the airplane, sort of that metaphor either. I mean, if you were going to do it, um, you know, some, stay with the airplane, you know, the airplane soaring over that. But the Titanic plate is like a whole different, you know, a whole different theme and it doesn't really add anything. So I think, um, yeah. Um, Deb, she says, I kind of like the oblivious passenger. Maybe that's just me. I picture the horizontal line not paying attention. Well, I think, um, I, I think the passenger, again, is sort of forcing the airplane in. Um, the sleeping line, I think, works okay. Um, if it was um, crashes with equal speed, a sleeping line joins them oblivious. I think that works a little bit. Um, yeah, so, hmm, yeah. I, I think maybe I would, I would cut the passenger. Because I think the problem is this when you're imagining the chalk as a plane taking off, there's sort of a problem with scale because the chalk is like the, the line of the chalk, the chalk itself would be the plane and sort of the line would be like the trail that it's leaving the, the contrail. Um, and that's kind of what the image is. And then when the line becomes the passenger, like we're suddenly inside the plane in a way that doesn't really make sense. I think, um, I was learning that sometimes lines can earn their keep just by being enjoyable. No, um, yeah, I think that, I think the, um, yeah, if you, um, if the, if the, if the poem is like full of that and that's the kind of poem it is, but this is a poem, it's a very tight, concise poem, um, like the, the first one was too. And so the, the sort of the brevity and the concision is real, is the, um, is the heart of the poem and what makes it work. I mean, you have to like, look at what you're doing, what you've written and see like what made that work, what was working there and what wasn't. If it's a poem that's sort of meandering all over and making sort of surprise playfulness everywhere, um, it makes a lot of sense. But when there's this sort of playful line, that's the only one where we do that, then it kind of, um, um, yeah, it, it just kind of stands out and doesn't make, let the poem feel like it's its own sort of complete unit. Um, yeah. See, Farrell says the tectonic plate fits into the mountain building that she's making large. Yeah, of course. I mean, it, it, but it does, you know, it, it's a it's a tangent because um, we're not talking about mountain building. You know, we, we went from airplanes taking off. It's almost like a mixed metaphor in a poem this short. So they have to totally different metaphors. Um, you know, so if there's mountains, the plane should be flying over the mountains. So there's some continuity there, you know, which, which is at the end. But it's not about the mountains being made. Um, I don't know. I don't feel like I'm articulating that very well. But, um, yeah. Yeah. So, so anyway. Yeah. As Liz Brown says, this poet's strength is in concision. I think um, I would make the second poem shorter. Exactly. I mean, that's the thing. Nate Jacobs says, concise language necessitates sharp imagery and intention. This poem starts that way, but adds too much for the number of words to support the number of images. Hey, that's a great way to put it. Yeah. And so, you know, the way that this poem works, and even this poem, you know, the goldfish one, uh, you know, could have been a lot shorter and more concise, even though concise though it is. There's still words you can clip out. And that was sort of the beauty of the poem. Um, and I think that's the, you know, go for that one. That's your style. Um, yeah. And so I think, um, yeah, and I think the A is looming over like mountains because that's sort of part of the image of the plane too. Um, and so I think that that works. And I would just just cut off this pot and then find a more interesting ending. I pray she will soar of these heights one day. Um, it is sort of a summary type thing. And I think it's not quite the last line. I, the sentiment is there. Um, Deb T says it's like it collapses under the weight of the words I like that that idea too maybe that's the place to go um, 
Hmm. Yeah. Mark Gunnar says breaking the second poem in its stanzas might help. Again, a lot of a lot of times we look at um for short poems, we look at uh Mike White. You know, the the sort of you know, and then if they're short and um, formal, would be Nancy, uh, Wendy Vidalock. But um, but if we look at some, let's look at Southpaw, which was just is that a good one? I mean, that was just the poem of the day a couple of days ago. Um, let's look at this one instead. Look how concise this poem is. This is Mike White's happiness. Happiness fills half a room. No one around to lift the thing, all those parts. After a while, you give up, even dusting. And so see how that, that it's, it's really tight and concise. And every word contributes to the sort of overall little jewel of poem that we have. Um, we can look at South, Southpaw, too, because the same thing happens. When you have this, this sort of tight, concise style, um, Southpaw. The boy every boy wanted to be, showing us one day in the dugout how he'd bloodied his old man's gravestone with a single fist, with a right and a right and a right, because he started to say and stopped. We all looked at our hands. We all had fathers. And so, um, and, and you might need to know in this poem what a southpaw is. It's a lefty. Um, so if you're into sports or at all, um, or... Uh, or boxing, I guess, I guess, you know, fighting is a sport too. Um, you know, that's, that's a lefty. And so the father, you know, sort of a father cliche kind of thing, telling their son to make sure if you punch someone, use your, your non throwing hand. Um, but the, the point is that all this, everything here is sort of a straight line in service of the, the little thing that it's making, the little point that it's making, you know, um, which is this father-son relationship really hard to articulate. Um, I'll read it again. Southpaw. Every, the boy every boy wanted to be, showing us one day in the dugout how he'd bloodied his old man's gravestone with a single fist, with a right and a right and a right, because he started to say and stopped. We all looked at our hands. We all had fathers. And so, you know, it, it t speaks to the really complicated sort of father-son relationship, into a parent dying um, and sort of leaving you. And, and there's all this sort of the, um, the sort of rage that comes with loss, but then, um, but still remembering the things that the, the person said, um, you know, there's all that. And, um, it, but it's all told in this sort of one direction. I mean, everything is going here to this one spot, you know? And um, if we look back here, you know, it's close to doing that in both these poems, um, but, but you can see the way the, um, the, the, the tectonic plates colliding with the board are different. It's a different direction than the plane. You know, it's a different sort of scale and metaphor and symbol. And so it's not all in service to the one thing. So it doesn't have that same power of concision, if that makes sense. Um, so how would you do that in this poem is the question. And I think just making a few tweaks and then coming up with something that's not summarizing. If we look at Southpaw, we all looked at our hands. We all had fathers. And so we can all imagine the fa our fathers dying, you know, because we all have parents. So there's, there's all that in there. Um, and, and it just lets it, lets it leave there without sort of summarizing. If we look back at the other poem we looked at, which was um, Happiness. Um, you know, Happiness. You know, we have this happiness, which is sort of personified as like a thing, filling half the room, no one around to lift the thing, all those parts. After a while, you give up even dusting. So the after a while, you give up even dusting. It's not, it's not, it's, it's presenting us a symbolic image that has some kind of resonance to it and letting us interpret that. Um, and so with this, what you want to do is let this image of the chalk airplane, like stick to that because that works. Um and let that somehow find a way to let that express the concept of praying she will soar over the heights. Um, and it's a difficult thing to do, but, um, but, but finding a way to stay within that frame with a poem that's concise is really important, I think. Okay, let me move on. Hopefully that's helpful. I, it's, it's a hard thing to, um, 
you know, you have to rewrite the poem to do. But but there's a way that you can work within, and even um, what even if it was like for example, I just say this. So, uh, and to do this, I'm gonna have to uh, pull out the poem. So hang on, this is just actually. I guess I can go like this. Download the file. Hang on one second. Just downloading so I can edit it because I'm looking at the screen here. Um, So here are the poems. Let's see. Um, there, there it is. Okay, so and let's get that distraction out of the way. Um, okay, her chalk takes off an airplane, up slanting line, down slanting line, crashes with equal speed. And I would just cut this too. I mean, I know. The sleeping line is nice, but I don't think it's necessary. Make small A's, I say. Her, a, her I guess we got to do this. Make small A's so we don't get confused. Loom over mine. She creates mountains. But what if it was like this? What if it was this? She creates the mountains. She will soar over. one day um so see how much tighter this is we got rid of the the superfluous stuff uh and we can do a little bit of live because your chalk takes off an airplane slanting an airplane up slanting line down slanting line crashes with equal speed she makes sm makes small a's i say her a's loom over mine I wonder if this is even creating. Creating the mountain, she will soar over one day. Now see how because that is all focused in, in one direction, we're sort of on this one note that just it really hits so much harder. Um, I think if you do it that way, than adding the extra stuff. So that would be my suggestion for this poem is sort of stick to that. And and maybe you could tweak and add a little bit to it, but maybe you don't even need to. Um Yeah. Okay. Let's do one more before we go. I hope that's helpful. I think that's a, that's a better way to see what I was talking about there. Um, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Um, Dick Western time says um, the A's. What if um, her letters loom? Then you get the the um, you get the alliteration too. Her letters loom over mine. I think we can make it a little shorter. Maybe like this. Uh, maybe, what if we did it like, kind of like that? Yeah. Mark Grinder says, yes, but the plate tectonics metaphor is lost. The plate tectonics metaphor is a different poem. I mean, that's the thing. Like we're cramming things in that you could make a separate poem that's that. We could we could make if we wanted to use the technics and not the airplane we could make the poem do that um, but um, but but with a poem this tight you want I mean the tightness is what's the value of the poem that's what makes the poem really powerful um, and so so keeping it focused on that task and, and not being distracted away from it makes the poem a lot better so so I think that yeah and, and people are agreeing with that so I think this I think this is the way to go with it. You could also do it though. Um, um, you know, you could. Her chalk takes off an airplane over a continent. Um, you know, and don't do the up lines, down lines. You know, talk about the lines of the continent, and then you get the tectonics back and the mountains. You could do it that way, but you kind of have to pick one or the other. Because a poem this quick, it's that it's that being so concise, being having the, the depth in such a small space that makes it work. So it's sort of pick one thing. You don't move all around in a short poem. Um, and then clearly the poet um, is, a, is a short poem fan and wants to be writing short poems, which are great. Um, but so stay on task within that, that short poem style. Hmm. Okay. So anyway, let's move on again. Uh, it's past the hour mark, but I don't have anywhere in particular to rush off to. So let's take a look at another poem. 
And um, this one next is Noel Schwellensattel. Um, from it looks like um, somewhere maybe Norway. Um, IT. I'm not sure where IT is actually, the country. IT? I'm not sure. Iceland? Anyway, let's see what this is. Very short. Oh, and the poem is in whatever language. So we can't really help because unless anybody speaks whatever Icelandic. Um, so maybe we can't do this poem. Screen read. Um, Imitin des Erbstis Ein Hauch von Nostalgi. Aranir Mitch. Is it German? Mitch an die Wegenheit. Ein Zit Voller Melody? Italy? Is that Italy? I don't know. I mean, the language doesn't look Italian. It looks German. I don't know. I'm not very worldly. But anyway, we can't really, unless somebody has something to say about this, we can't really talk about it. Um, so I'll have to let uh, Noel know. Um, let's see. Next, we will go to... Next, let's go to... Um, uh, Michael Ballard and Michael Ballard has I think two poems yeah we'll do the two for Michael Ballard and we'll wrap it up this was um, submission from from February 10th so we're getting a little better no specific questions let's take a look at uh, Misunderstanding by Michael Ballard Misunderstanding when I asked you what you said, you said you said the years are flying by. I needed you to repeat it because I thought you said the tears are flying by, and I pictured teardrops filling the corners of your eyes, hardy droplets carried away by a mighty wind. And because there is so much anger and sadness in the world, I saw oceans of teardrops swept into the gust of a mad maelstrom. Imagine the floods, the devastation, the havoc such a flurry would unleash on our hapless globe, easily making Noah's tempest a mere ripple in this galactic teapot. Not that this should be a competition, which epoch in mankind's history deserves the harshest cleansing. I only know that when I hurt you, deliberately or not, I deserve the stain of your tears. Um, so this poem, I love the beginning. Um, yeah. Yeah, so Monica Dobas confirms German, as does James Langford. Oh, James here. Make sure you saw the, the four guys in the truck talk, James, if you're coming in late. Um, and Rose Leonard points out that the German's spoken in parts of northern Italy, so that's interesting, too. Um, yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, misunderstanding. So I love the beginning of this poem. Um, I, I like the twist. Like, it, it takes something, you know, tears are one of those topics that we say... Um, you know, it's sort of cliche and sort of trite a lot of times in poems. But this takes it and turns it on its head and makes it interesting. Um, yeah, Dick Weinsheimer says, I really like the conceit of this. Cut out most all the adjectives and it becomes a poem. Um, I, I think, to me, I love the conceit, but I think at the end becomes too summarizing and not interesting and surprising enough. And so I, I love the setup, but I don't think it's found its ending yet, um, is what I would say. So I love this. A misunderstanding. I think it's a fun title because we, because the poem becomes clear pretty quickly. When I asked you what you said, you said you said, the tears are flying by, the years are flying by. I needed you to repeat it because I thought you said the tears are flying by. Um, and so we get the story. We don't really know who the you and I are, but we get these two people talking um, and we get what they're talking about. Um, you know, the years are flying by, um, starting out like the recent um, prop for the prompt lines, which was to take a uh, an idiom and turn it on its ear somehow. So take the years are flying by and, and twist it. The tears are flying by. So we play with that a little bit and take it more literally. Um, I needed you to repeat it because I thought you said the tears are flying by and I pictured. So, so a nice twist. And then we see the twist, which wasn't really sort of illuminated. And then we illuminate it and, and make it turn into a picture. I pictured teardrops filling the corners of your eyes, hardy droplets carried away by a mighty wind. Um, and 
And because there is so much anger and sadness in the world, I saw oceans of teardrops swept into the gust of a mad maelstrom. Um, Dick Westheimer says cutting out the adjectives. Does it sound better that way? Um, adjectives are the weakest uh, you know, type of, of storytelling type of words. I picture teardrops filling the corner of your eyes, droplets carried away by a wind. Um, I, to me, I think that the, they work there. I think the hardy and the mighty are okay um, because they add to the grandeur of it. Um, Elizabeth Prince says take out hardy. The hardy is the one that um, I, I like the mighty wind. Yeah. Um... Rose says I lose the galactic teapot personally. Yeah. Well, anyway, so so think about the the adjectives. I do think you know if you can take them out without losing anything, always take them out. And that's just the general rule of thumb because it's stronger without them if you don't need them. But the the, the idea of the that the, they're big teardrops, I think, is something we have to get across. I mean, I mean, you could do something like droplets plunking on the ground but carried away, or you know, some kind of thing to signify in a more vivid way that they're big. I think we need the sense that they're big, though, carried away by a mighty wind. And because there was so much anger and sadness in the world, I saw oceans of tear drops swept into the gust of a mad maelstrom. And it's a great image. Imagine the floods, the devastation, the havoc such a fury would unleash on our hapless globe, easily making, I think this whole, the hapless globe is good, easily making Noah's tempest a mere ripple. I think the easily and the mere are things to cut here, but the whole thing might be. I think it feels like the the voice like changes a little bit there in a way that pulls you out of the poem. You know, it's a different way of speaking and a way of, of telling. Um, yeah. So, um, Mark Gunnar says the word galactic is overblown for its use here. Yeah. And to question about Maelstrom is already mad. Yeah, that, that's a good point too. So, so you could trim out that, the gust of a maelstrom. Imagine the floods, the devastation, the havoc such a fury would leash on our hapless globe. I don't know if you need a hapless either on our globe. And then I think this is just, I, I would cut that. Not that this should be a competition. And I think the poem works up until this point. Um, which epoch in mankind's history deserves the harshest cleansing? Um... And I think this, I think the poem works except for this ending. Um, I only know what, um, that when I hurt you deliberately or not, I deserve the stain of your tears. And the stain of your tears is kind of cliche. And the whole thing summarizes. Um, I think what you want, what will make the poem really work, which is to go into something sort of surprising and, and more concrete at the end. Um, not that this should be a competition, which epoch in mankind's history deserves the harshest cleansing? And then maybe some kind of, you could do some kind of gesture, um, you know, where you can see the actual movement of the two people maybe, um, or, or just something. You, you want it to go somewhere surprising here. Um, the, the poet I was thinking of, um, if you look back at Jane Hirschfield's episode, of the Rattlecast, and I can't think of a specific poem to call out off the top of my head, but there's a way that she sort of has these transitions using philosophical statements where she turns, the, the poem turns on concepts, which is really interesting. And I think there's a place you could do that here. You know, which epoch in mankind's history deserves the harshest cleansing? And then say something totally different as a last line. Um, it's hard to, you know, I can't make that up for you. But, um, but it needs something else than, than just this sort of summarizing ending to it. Yeah, as Deb T says, the last couple of lines seem a little melodramatic or sentimental. Um, and Michael Dobas says equating personal suffering to a whole epoch that needs cleansing is a gesture too much, I think. Yeah, I think, um, I wish I could pull up a poem. I think there's one I'm thinking of, but I, I couldn't find it. If I had to like flip through the Rattlecast. Um, to see it. Um, but anyway, but but some kind of surprise last stanza that, that's somehow concrete. Like you could do some kind of gesture being made between the people to pull it back to the beginning where we, we were asking each other something, a sort of almost like a call back to the actual present moment after this reverie. I think that would work. Or some kind of 
extra question that's even different than this. So we sort of follow, piggy up on the question structure, but then make the question push even farther. Um, which epoch in mankind's history deserves the harshest cleansing? Which era? Blah, blah, blah. You know, and then leave it there and just let the poem hang. Um, so, yeah. So anyway, let's take a look at the other poem too. I think, I think it's just, it's a poem in search of its ending a little bit too. I, I agree. The more I look at it, um, things like mad should be cut and the adjective stick. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Let's take a look at the other one. This is writing exercise. Number one, again, this is Michael Ballard. Let's make something with a rhyme this time, something slight, light and airy and not expected to carry the burden of our woes because heaven knows there's plenty to scare us and little to spare us from our horror of reality, our dust, a dusty temporality. From cradle to grave, we create and we save our precious finite memories. Victories and injuries become the compost and the fodder of the hero and the rotter, whose are worse than a misbegotten life, the curse of a forgotten life. All have a story to tell that we hope will long dwell on the hearts and minds of those we leave behind. Because on that day when all goes poof, our stories are the only proof there was an entity, an existence, an identity that roamed this earth and from the moment of birth made an effort to leave a mark on the stern, stubborn bark of the callous tree of life. Words, words are my yawp against the strife and immobilizing fear that not one soul I knew I was here. Sorry, that one, not one soul knew I was here. Across my ready, supple keyboard, ten fingers danced like a ten, like ten deft swords. Verses spawned from muted growls, foreboding angst, climaxed in howls. I swore my roar might almost rip a hole through the cosmos. Um, but no, a booming silence, a chasm of indifference. My scribbles were a sham, the crook of another hapless, forlorn proof rock. This writing exercise belies a grandiose assumption to think I'd have the gumption to dare to claim that my tame verse might rip this mighty universe. My tread is but a minor scar, a microscope, scopic, tepid war, Shakespeare's walking shadow, a teapot tempest, mere bravado. Yet as I sit and type and fret that all I write, all will forget, a steady flame within keeps burning, a timeless and exquisite yearning to bear a truth beyond my purview. And while it is absurd to believe my feeble story might live on beyond in glory, fixed firmly, resolutely on the shelf of immortality, I shall fritter my scant time in blank verse and in rhyme, exploring life's condition for my own erudition. Before the reaper's patient spade has packed the soil upon my grave, I will write, I'll forge my swords, I'll play the scribe, and will survive to apprehend the meager words, what it means to be alive. So, um, so interesting poem here, writing exercise. I like, um, you know, I like formal poetry. Um, but as uh, Liz Brown says, many of the rhymes feel forced. Um, and, um, and Josh Williams says the rhymes could be stronger. Um, Deb Tito says this is keeping my attention. To me, I think this is a poem that goes on too far for its conceit um, and, and could be a lot shorter. I mean, like maybe three stanzas long and hold enough interest. Yeah, Elizabeth says this feels like a warm up. Oh, Deb Tito says this isn't keeping my attention. Okay. Yeah, I think it just goes on too far for what it does. There's little spots and you can sort of, I'm, I wonder if they're the same spots for everybody reading it where I can feel myself be sort of re-engaged and then I sort of lose focus and interest again and then I come back to it. So it's sort of this, you know, it's almost like, um, you know, if you're doing two things at once and you're sort of focusing on one task more than the other, um, you kind of go back and forth. Like a lot of times I do work while listening to um, like a podcast or something or a lecture and my attention will be on the work and then something will draw me in and I'll be listening to the thing for a while. And that's how the experience of this poem goes. Like sometimes I'm actually paying attention and sometimes I'm sort of distracted. I think the poem is too long um, for doing that. Um, but if it were short and just kept the things um, that worked, I think the poem could work. So for me, let's, I don't want to read the whole thing again because it's pretty long. Let's make something with a rhyme this time, something slight and airy. I, I like the beginning. Um, 
slight, light, and airy, and not expected to carry the burden of woes, because heaven knows there's plenty to scare us and little to spare us. Um, I think the, from so I, I start to I, I'm engaged here, then I kind of oops I'm engaged I'm looking at the wrong screen I'm engaged like up to here, and then I kind of lose interest for a while. I think it's the reality and the dusty temporality. Um, yeah. Um, Mark Gunier says there's a poem in this, but shorter with less effort put into rhyming back to blank verse, I think. Um, could be, I, I like some of the rhyming. I don't mind that. I think this thing goes on too long. Um, and there's weaker stuff in, you know, intermixed with the good stuff. Um, you know, so from cradle to grave, we create and we save our precious finite memories. I think that just seems forced. Um, you know, the rhyme's kind of pulling the poem along without any sense of direction, Instead of like, you know, surprising uh, yourself with the poem, it, it, it's sort of like it's just cranking out the rhymes. Um, victories and injuries become compost and the fodder. I think, you know, I'm just, I'm spaced out for this section. I'll have a story to tell and to dwell. So it feels like we're sort of spinning our wheels um, for here. An identity around this earth from the moment of birth made an effort to leave a mark or just sort of repeating the same stuff and sort of spitting out these rhymes going nowhere. And it picks up again to me here, this writing exercise belies a grandiose assumption to think I'd have the gumption to dare to claim that my tame universe might tip this mighty or my, sorry, to dare to claim that my tame verse might tip this mighty universe. I like that a lot, actually. Um, so that's a section I would like save. Uh, my tread is but a minor scar, a microscopic, tepid war, Shakespeare's walking shadow, a teapot tempest, mere bravado. I like the shadow bravado and the tepid war and the, and the slant rhyme with war to scar. So I like this section. And then I sort of lose again as I sit and type and fret that all I write will all will forget. A steady flame within keeps burning, a tameless, exquisite, an exquisite yearning to bear truth beyond my purview. Um, and while it is absurd to, so I think there's too much just the rhyme pulling through and not really saying anything. But then toward the end, um, uh, before the reaper's patient spade has packed the soil upon my grave, I will write, I'll forge my swords, I'll play the scribe, and will, I will strive to apprehend meager words, what it means to be alive. I don't know. So I think, I think really if you take um, you know this section here and combine it with this you know so so the things that worked it could be like a three stanza poem that i think works um okay um let's see jay milton over on facebook says i think the rhymes are included to make a point about writing exercises the poem is a humorous exploration of writing exercises but yes i agree the whole thing should be shorter yeah i think the um yeah th there's a Let's see. I'm just looking at the other comments because I forgot to flip over to Facebook for a bit. Hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, so so there's not sort of enough playfulness that points to that to make it feel playful. Although I think, um, you know, poking fun at writing exercises. As we know, there's a whole, um, there's light uh, poetry magazine. And we had... Um, um, Melissa Balmain on is the guest for the Rattlecast about a year and a half ago, um, who edits that. And, and there, there, it's really fun to play with that. I think it's too long and not enough self-referential jokes to carry that concept of reading. If we focused on that, I think that would be great. And I think that is part of the point. It just doesn't hold our interest, um, or at least my interest enough, um, to, to carry on at this length like that. So if there were more... Um, you know, if there were more, sort of more still, I think it's not enough. It's sort of in this um, um, uncanny valley between making fun of itself and not, where it doesn't really have a humor. You know, if you got to push it all the way to humor, push it all the way to humor the whole time or not, um, you know. So so I think um, I would focus on that. Um, let's see, any other comments before we go?
Rose Leonard says uh, the poem claims to be about big existential questions, but there is little passion in it. Um, yeah, and I think if you, I, I think there's a poem in here, um, and if it that plays up the humor more and plays up that asking the big existential questions, but having no passion, addressing the lack of passion. And there's so much opportunity for things to do in this poem. It's just a matter of um, honing it in and, and staying on what's interesting and, and sort of um, pushing it. Yeah. Jesse Williams says, if it's going to be funny, the rhyme should be wild and unexpected. Yeah, I mean, there's... Um, let me wonder if there's a poem I could think of. You know, humor and poetry is tough to do. Um, because the, the page sort of sits so flat. It's sort of easy to do humor in a poetry reading and really hard to do it in a book. Um, but if you do, you know, having, you know, really over-the-top forced rhymes, really wild, unexpected rhymes, as Joshua says, um, you know, things that, that poke fun at that, I think that's definitely a, a great place for the poem to go. Um, but the poem's not there yet. So um, so a lot of things, a lot of, a lot of possibilities with this one. You got to figure out where you want to go. Okay, well, that's going to wrap up the Critique of the Week. I let it go pretty long today. Um, but it is a rainy day here in Southern California. I got nowhere else to go. I already took the dog for a walk in a little window we had. So that's it. Thanks, everybody, for the critique. We had a bunch of poems we looked at. I think we looked at f six poems by four poets plus um, two guys in a truck, little looks at happiness. Really fun critique, as always. Do click the like button if you haven't yet. That's always helpful wherever you're watching this. And uh, let's see. So coming up on the Rattlecast is going to be uh, Deborah Marquardt. And uh, she has a new... We published her way back in issue number 28 and not since. She was a finalist back then for the Rattle Poetry Prize. She has a new book, Gratitude with Dog Under Stairs, uh, new and collected poems. And so it's a thick beautiful book that just came in the mail to me and i said oh we published deborah a long time ago let's check in and see what she's been up to with this new and collected poems book um she's also the poet laureate of iowa i believe either current or past i can't remember um professor of um poetry and um in echo echo um you know ecological writing i can't remember what she called echo poetics i don't think that's what they called it but something like that at the at iowa state university i believe uh, but it should be fun talking to Deborah. Looking forward to seeing her, uh, reading her book and, and sharing poems from that over the weekend. And uh, that will be, though, a day late. So Christmas is, of course, December 25th. And we're going to move the Rattlecast up one day to December 26th on a Tuesday this week to accommodate because, um, uh, you know, you can't find guests. I don't know if you'd be or want to be around on Christmas Day anyway. So... We're going to move it up to Tuesday, write a cast number 225. The prompt for this week was to write a poem that includes multiple lists. So interpret that however you'd like. Um, be creative. I'm just, I don't know. There was um, a poem, though, in last week's guest, uh, Gaetan Scro had a poem where he sort of came in and out of lists. It was interesting. I thought we'd try that ourselves. That is the prompt for this week. Write a poem that includes multiple lists. And uh, we'll talk to Deborah Marquardt. On Tuesday, December 26th, the regular time, though, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Hope to see you then. Hope you have a great holiday, whatever it is you celebrate. And I will talk to you later. Goodbye. <laughs>